Well, I think we, we have to start at 7.30 just to be within our schedule. So just to introduce myself, my name is uh, Ahmed Radi. I'm an associate professor uh, of psychiatry and psychotherapy at Alexandria University School of Medicine in Egypt. And our topic today will be uh, targeting suicidal patients. And suicide is a, is a, is a truly complicated issue. And um, why I want to uh, expose this, uh, this uh, problematic issue from a different perspective rather than the classical CBT, which is the commonly used uh, psychotherapeutic modality to uh, target this problem, is that the decision to end one's life is a very difficult decision. And it implicates a lot of, uh, a lot of inner resources, um, emotional discharge, a um, uh, lot of cognitive processing, and uh, it's a very hard decision to take. And I think that the conscience is playing a major role in that stuff, in just giving the order whether it's right or wrong to end one's life. Always one is justifying to end, to end his life. Everyone has his justification even for suicide. Any action he has a justification to go through. So whether the conscience is playing a role for that, uh, this is what we are going to explore today. And as we have two hours to, uh, to go through this workshop, uh, I'm proposing that uh, my colleague, Dalia Nagy, she is an assistant lecturer at the Department uh, of Psychiatry at Alexandria University, where I work. And um, she, is, uh, she has been um, conducting uh, group psychotherapy uh, for, uh, for a quite long time for the uh, uh, patients with high risk for suicide, including borderline groups. And she has been maintaining those uh, participants and the groups uh, even with a difficult um, diagnosis like the borderline with high suicidal risk for even more than three continuous years, which is a, is a very good uh, uh, achievement. Uh, so I'm proposing that she will present the DBT model, which is the dialectical behavioral model that's currently uh, working there at uh, Alexandria. And uh, after that, I will uh, expose the theory of uh, the uh, conscience conceptualization, which is, uh, by the way, is not a new theory, it's an old theory dating back to 80s. But what I'm going to, to propose is my personal interpretation and how can I see things differently so that it can fit as an integrative part or an integrative tool to enrich the uh, classical CBT techniques. Uh, thank you for your presence. I know this is the end of the day, so I'm very uh, grateful that you came. And I'm trying to spread the knowledge about what we do in Egypt. We first, we, when we thought about this uh, workshop, me and Professor Ahmad Razi, we thought about exploring how we could um, deal with suicidal persons. So we are going to, uh, to talk about two models, the DBT model and then the, the conscious model, and see how we can uh, help those people in uh, ways that are not that traditional as the, the simple, uh, simple CBT. So as Dr. Radi said, um, I work about, uh, among a team who is uh, conducting the dialectical behavioral therapy for borderline personality. As, as you know, 70% uh, of patients with borderline personality uh, try to commit suicide or think about suicide. So this is a, a, a very risky group to, to work with. So our agenda will be that uh, we are going to talk about uh, the, the explanation of suicide uh, in the DBT model. Uh, we, we will talk about some guidelines that we all respect when we, we deal with them using this model. Uh, and we are going to talk about two uh, special situations. We deal with suicidal patients, whether on the phone, because uh, in the DBT model we allow a crisis phone calls from the patients. If I ha am having a suicidal uh, thoughts, I can uh, call one of my therapists. And we have a schedule for the phone coaching. We are t uh, calling it a coach uh, phone to tell them how to pass this crisis. This is an acute crisis on the phone. And the other situation, if we uh, actually meet the patient on his uh, therapy day, or he came for an extra session, or his regular session, and he told me when we are analyzing the past week that I had a suicidal attempt, I had a suicidal thought, what, how can we deal with him? 
So, uh, as Marsha Linehan, the, the founder of the DBT model, said, uh, describes her patients, she says that borderline, in borderline individuals uh, are the psychobiological equivalent of third degree burn patients. They don't have an emotional skin. They can't bear emotions very well. They simply have, so to speak, no emotional skin. Even the slightest touch or movement can create immense suffering. So uh, you can imagine if you have someone who is burned, he cannot uh, be be bear the touch. They can't bear words, they can bear emotions. They are highly, uh, they are always suffering and they have always pain. So in the DBT model, suicide behavior e equals maladaptive problem solving behavior. They use the suicide to try as a trial to solve their problems. They don't do it to get attention. This is a myth about them. We don't try, uh, if I am a borderline patient, I'm not trying to get attention by killing myself. This is not true. They, they actually can't, tre can't uh, solve their problems and the way they can solve the problem is by trying to kill themselves, to, to get rid of the pain, to help others to get rid of their burden. So this is the main thing that we, we, we have to, to know when we deal with borderline patients. They don't commit suicide for attention. They just don't know how to solve the problem with uh, adaptive uh, skills. So in the DBT treatment, we are trying to give them better ways to deal, but this is not our topic. So uh, our aim when we deal with those patients is to give them a life worth living. We are trying to coach them, to give them skills, to and the first goal in the treatment is not to kill themselves. There is no suicide or parasuicidal behaviors so that we can adjust the life and having a life worth living. The general guidelines about suicide in those patients, uh, if I am a therapist that wants to help them, I have to be flexible in my response to the suicide. Uh, usually, how do you react if you have uh, a patient who is suicidal? How is your reaction? Uh, can you share with me your experience? A suicidal patient, how can you respond to that? Any ideas? It says a uh, difficult situation. If I, I have a patient who is coming to me and saying, I want to kill myself, I want to end my life, I, this is not uh, easy, I think. So uh, how is your response? During the crisis, yes, th th that's a, a good way to respond, <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have to be flexible, we have to, to give them the opportunity to, to, to tell us why they want to end their life, uh, be more active, especially when we explore and find that suicide risk is high, uh, using non-conservative response, not the, the usual conservative response that Sometimes we think the suicidal patient needs uh, hospitalization, needs medications. No, it's not as simple as this. It's not, it, it will not solve the problem. Be honest about the reasons for response. Um, usually I tell my patients, I uh, want to help you. I don't want you to, to kill yourself because I'm, I really care. And I have to be honest when I say this, that I really care about the, her life, I want to help her. So we have to be honest about the, the reasons. And uh, we have to talk about the suicidal patients openly about the suicide. It's not something to be ashamed of. Uh, we want to ask about it indirectly. We ask about the suicide directly. And it's a fact that uh, if you have a borderline personality, you will have thoughts ab uh, about suicide or maybe attempts. So it, it is a fact. It's not something to be ashamed of. Uh, we have to avoid pejorative explanations <laughs> in our countries. Uh, sometimes if uh, the, the therapists use some ex explanations that the patient doesn't have faith or uh, he's a weak person, uh, he's uh, not strong enough to face his problems, all those are pejorative. We, we, we can't use those explanations when dealing with them. Uh, and we have to explain 
uh, for them that we know that they use suicide as a response to a problem that they don't want actually to kill themselves. Uh, and, uh, and that it is a maladaptive behavior and we have to, to find an alternative adaptive behavior to replace it. Uh, we don't uh, work with suicidal borderline patients alone. I can't be his or her only therapist. We work among a team. Actually, uh, the patient at least has three different therapists because he under or he or her undergoes uh, an individual session, individual sessions, and also group skills session. So at least he has three different therapists. And uh, yes, 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 three. Uh, and we always have a weekly consultation meeting. And uh, when we have among us one who has uh, a patient who had an attempt for the last week, we call it an emergency consultation meeting and we have to, to talk together uh, to support uh, our colleague who has a patient who are uh, suicidal, to, to talk about it, how we can help the patient and help the, our colleague himself. So even the therapist has to consult about the attempt of suicide with his colleagues. Uh, and especially we have to pay more attention to the patients who are not uh, regular in, in coming to their sessions because it can say that they, they might have suicidal thoughts and that they don't want to explore them, they don't come to the session. So even if uh, I found my patients dropping out some sessions, I have to uh, try to reach them and know why they don't come. So those are the guidelines. Now we will talk about the two situations, the phone call and the, the regular session. Uh, usually uh, therapists don't like to, to, have to receive phone calls from their patients. But for those patients, we say that uh, suicide is frequent and it, is, it will be a life-saving phone call. But it's not a, a, a just a regular phone call to, to talk. Um, it is a, a phone coaching call. That means the patient calls me and she asks, she's asking for help. I reached a point where I'm thinking about killing myself because I don't know how to, to deal with this situation. Tell me what to do. So there are some points that we have to consider dealing with them. Uh, this is our management list during the phone call. First of all, I will, I will uh, go through them and then talk about them uh, in a little bit in detail. The first thing is to assess the imminent risk, the risk that is present right now of suicide or self-harm. Then we have to explore the problem that is going on right now, not the problem that is going on in her life in general, no, right now. Then focus on problem solving of this immediate problem or this immediate situation and we have to reinforce every step that the patient is trying to do in attempt to uh, cooperate with me and punish any suicidal response because as we said, our first goal, uh, in our, our first point, in our contract, therapeutic contract, is not to kill yourself. Uh, troubleshoot about any problem that comes and uh, uh, the patient cannot uh, deal with the, the plan of action that uh, we, we have uh, together and then I have to think about that it might be a recurrence of the suicidal behavior and then reassess at the end of the phone call. All of those steps, we have to do them in five or six minutes. But the, 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 the good news is that uh, I know how, what I'm going to say when I'm, I will take this call. I, I, I might have a paper with those points with me so that when the patient calls me, I know that I have to to do those eight points when she tells me that she's suicidal. The first thing, assess imminent risk, uh, risk, suicide risk. I'm asking the patient, where are you now? Who are you with? Uh, what are you doing as a risk behavior? Do, do you have any lethal weapon? Do you have any uh, medications? Do you have um, a rope? Do you do you, are, you, are, you go, are you going to jump from the window? We are assessing the behavior, the risky behavior that can precipitate suicide. 
So this is the imminent risk. And then the exploring the problem right now. Identify events which have set off current crisis response. Why is she, does she want to kill herself right now? What happened in the past few minutes or hours? And formulate and summarize the problem situation with the patient. I have to, uh, to do the reflective listening. I, I will tell her in brief a resume of what she told me about her problem right now. Uh, and regarding the problem right now, I have to explore the environment where she is while she's call, uh, talking to me, and I'm, I'm saying almost she, because uh, majority of patients with so borderline personality are females. That's, that's why I'm using uh, an example, a female. Uh, regarding the environmental factor, I have to uh, reduce the availability of lethal means. If she has a, a, a firearm, I have to tell her to drop it or give it to someone, uh, matches or any lethal weapon, she has to get rid of the, uh, the, the lethal mean, remove or counteract suicidal models. I have to remind her that we uh, agreed that you don't commit suicide. Increase social support. If the patient is alone, I'm advising her to go and meet someone, be with friends, with neighbors. She can't stay alone or pass this night alone. Or contact professional and personal network. If uh, she can't reach me, she ha can reach one of my colleagues, one of the team. She can go to the hospital where we, we work together to, to see someone. Uh, and restrict confidentiality. Uh, if I, I know one of her parents or her family, I can call someone to help her. We, she cannot stay alone. And finally, remove or reduce stressful events and demands. Uh, for example, if she has someone with her at home who is causing um, this suicidal event, uh, she, she has to, to move away from this person or uh, stop the, the situation, remove patient from the environment. If needed, the last thing we do is the, the hospitalization. If possible, we don't do that. Also, we explore the behavioral factors. Pay attention to, to, to the mood of the patient, the affect, rather than content. Um, I don't get overwhelmed by the patient in tears on the phone, help me, I'm going to die, I just called you to say goodbye. I, I have to focus on the content of her words and not be driven by the emotions and the flooding of, of emotions of the patient. Um, I have to know where this emotion goes, uh, validate and soothe the moment. I have to say that I know how hard this is for you, I know that uh, this is not a good time, I know that you are suffering, that you need help to soothe the moment. Uh, we, we try as possible some cognitive restructuring about, uh, for example, uh, if the patient says, life is doesn't worth, I'm a failure, no one loves me, we are trying to say, but no, no you, you are telling me that no one loves you, but yesterday you were out with four friends who really like you and are always there for you, and if you call one of them right now, they will be uh, happy to help you. Uh, instruct in immediate emotional regulation techniques. We have skills about emotional regulation, and I can uh, tell her, do you remember the session when we talked about how to decrease the effect of negative emotions? How about doing them right now? Consider non-short-term non, uh, somatic treatment. If she is, uh, uh, that she has also an organic problem, she has, she has headache. I have to respect that the headache might worsen the situation. So how about taking some analgesics for your headache or your toothache? Focus on affect tolerance. Uh, usually they tell us that I can't bear the pain anymore. I can't bear the emotions that I feel anymore. So I, I have to, to respect that uh, the problem is to, to, to focus on uh, the tolerance of the affect itself rather than the affect. Uh, we have to generate hope. I have to tell her this situation will, will, uh, will pass. You, you are strong. You can um, tolerate this distress uh, I, and instillate some hope and reasons for living. Uh, how about your family? That you have a little girl. Uh, you like her so much, you are a good mother. Uh, there are good reasons for you, but not uh, in an accusive way. 
I don't want to the patient to, to feel guilty. Um, uh, you are telling me I want to die and leave my, my child. I'm, I'm not a bad mother. No, we don't accuse them, but we are just giving them some reasons for um, how, how life can be a good thing for you. You don't, you, you don't need to die. Activate the behavior. Uh, you have now, uh, uh, you have to, to, to get dressed and go out. Uh, I'm with you on the phone. Let's uh, see how are you going to, to go. Will you call a friend to drive you? So we activate the behavior. And even if the, the, the patient tried to do some maladaptive response, I have to stop it and insist on that no, you have to do what I'm saying. You're going to get dressed, take a taxi, go to the hospital and talk to Dr. Uh, Ahmed, and you are going to give me a phone call when you arrive there, for example. The point after this, so we, we explored the problem. We are going to, to, to do some problem solving. I can't neglect the problem. For example, one patient can, uh, called me. Uh, she was in a crisis. She wanted to kill him herself because um, her ex-husband called her and told her that he will not give her money anymore. She has a child, she's not working, uh, her, her parents died, and she doesn't have any source for money. So I have to, to talk with the patient in the current problem now. I can't neglect the problem totally. Empath empathically, tell the patient not to commit suicide. I have to tell. I know that, the pa that this problem is really uh, a big problem, and we have to explore it together when you come to the next uh, session. But even with this problem and how big it is, you can't kill yourself. You have to be uh, safe so that we can try to figure out how to solve your problem, your current problem. Uh, persist to statements that suicide is not a good solution, that we have to, to think together, to collaborate, to find a better one. Um, to predict consequences of various plans of action, we are, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell her, if you come to uh, the next session, maybe we are going to, to see uh, how, uh, how are your opportunities, even if you want to find a job, I can call the social worker to help you, uh, and the consequences of this, you will be able to, to help your child, you won't be uh, uh, in a situation where you have to, to take money from your ex-husband, Confront the patient's ideas or behavior directly. I know that you are thinking about death. I know that you, uh, you might uh, be in pain. I'm, I'm confronting her with, with her uh, ideas. Give advice and make direct suggestions. Because in this situation, the patient cannot think by herself. I have to suggest, I, 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 am, I will be a little bit more active to tell her what to do. And we will uh, continue thinking together later in the sessions Offer solution from perspective of the other skills of the patient is learning. Uh, we already uh, had some exercises about mindfulness. How about doing them right now? S things that uh, skills that she already learned. Clarify and reinforce adaptive adaptive response. Uh, and after the, uh, as I said, we have to reinforce the progress. Yes, that's good. You already get, got dressed. That's very good. I'm proud of you. You are really trying hard. Uh, now you are going to, to take uh, the taxi. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for a call in uh, 10 minutes. You, st you will tell me how, uh, you, how it worked with you. When she calls me, I will reinforce. That's very good. You are really doing great. And punishing any suicidal uh, behavior. And we have to... to to commit to a plan of action at the end of the call, I, I will uh, summarize what I'm going to, do, what uh, she has to do right now. So now, after uh, ending the call with, with me, you're going to go to the hospital. You're going to meet Doctor X. You're going to do th this and that. Uh, repeat after me your plan of action, and she has to commit and and say that she will uh, do this plan. Um, we don't cl end the, the phone call uh, feeling that the patient is really safe because the crisis is not over. I have to think that it might recur. Uh, maybe after she, she ends the phone with me, she has another phone call from someone who 
to exacerbate the, the, the situation. So I have to tell her, so now, if uh, any problem occurred right now, will you think again about the suicide or not? Uh, and if this occurs, how are you going to respond? What are you going to do? Maybe we have a deal that you, you call me back again. Maybe uh, you will tell yourself that I will do nothing till I meet my, uh, my therapist. So I have to, to think about the reoccurrence of the crisis and have a backup plan if this occurs. And I have to give the patient a near um, session time, schedule time. Uh, I can't uh, tell her to come after 10 days or a week, maybe in, in the, the next 42 or uh, 24 or 48 hours, not later than this. Uh, we reassess at the end. We don't assume that suicide ideation is gone or don't assume that suicide risk has gone down. And we, we don't assume that suicide risk won't come back. It, it will come back again and again every time she feels uh, in a crisis or in a distress. And uh, I, I would like to, to do uh, a little bit of exercise if we try to simulate the role of a therapist and the, the, the patient who is calling and saying that I am uh, thinking about suicide. Can we do this even in small groups, three together or the three together? Uh, one they can simulate the role of a patient who is uh, calling and saying, um, I want to kill myself, I have this, uh, <laughs> this mean of suicide. And the other one will try to do the role of the doctor who is, uh, will use those points, the, f the coaching. And the third uh, person may be the observer and tell us uh, at the end how he saw the interaction between the two. Okay, we can do it in five minutes, 10 minutes. So, um, how about, how was it?
So we, we have to continue because of the time. So uh, I just heard lots of remarks so about uh, why should, uh, the patient will not call me. She already wants to kill herself. No, actually they, they, want, they will call you. Um, she will insist of telling me that uh, she's, uh, she's not okay, sh that she doesn't want to do whatever I, w I want. Uh, I'm telling uh, here this group, they said, uh, I was trying to give her some positive remarks and she insisted on the negative, sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry for the interruption. Um, whenever the patient tries to, um, to drag us to the, his negative way of thinking, we just uh, focus on giving him back, uh, bring him back on the track. No, we are focusing on the plan. You have to do one, two, three. So we, we are the coach. He, he, uh, the patient himself he doesn't know how to, be, um, how to get out. So we have to give him back. Uh, do you have any remarks before continuing? I will call him. Yeah. No, I have to, to, to be in the start of the treatment, I have to know his number, uh, number of a relative, and yes, you know, I have to reach him. <laughs> no. Yeah, I can call um, his sig the significant person that he is collaborating with me in his treatment, whether a partner, a mother, a neighbor. No, I call him first. Okay. Call him first. Usually they don't do this. Uh, they call us because they need help. They don't hang <laughs> up on us. I did, I, I didn't happen with me. But if it happens, I will call the patient first. If not, I will call a uh, significant, uh, we usually have numbers for at least two persons who are in direct contact with the patient, okay? So we move on. The second situation when uh, I'm, I'm actually in my office and the patient came and when we are reviewing the past week, the, pa the patient said that uh, I had suicidal attempt or suicidal thought the last week. Here we are going to explore more the risk factors, the long-term risk factors, not just the imminent risk factors, but all we all also, for example, uh, if the patient has uh, substance use disorder, um, a single person, a not working person, a male, <laughs> it's a risk factor, um, no support at all, no family, no friends. So we have to assess all the risk factors that might um, predict that this person will commit suicide again. Uh, the difference between the, the, the this uh, approach versus the phone coaching is that we just, here we, we, the patient is already safe in front of me so I have to explore more what happened. It, uh, the f for the phone coaching, I'm aiming to save his pati the patient's life, just save his life. We are not um, dealing with why did he try to commit suicide. But when I'm uh, having the patient in front of me, I have to do some analysis, behavioral analysis and solution analysis. The behavioral analysis or the chain analysis from the name itself, it is like the domino effect. I have to know or to explore and find the starting point who created this crisis. Where is the, the starting point that when it precipitated, the patient started to think about suicide. Uh, so behavioral chain analysis is the process for examining the chain of events that leads up to a problematic behavior. And in here, this is uh, the problematic behavior is the suicide. I have to sit and uh, we have a paper and pen, and pen and try to write down all what happened in the last 24, sometimes 48 or even three or four or five days and search for the beginning of this problem. Yeah. The patient is safe, He's not. he doesn't have a, any lethal weapon in front of me in the office everything is fine, but he came and told me that I tried to kill myself or 
I went to see him in the hospital later after the crisis gone. He's gone, he's safe, and everything is all right. And we have to analyze the, what happened later. When he's safe, of course, yeah, you're right. So this is uh, the, the wh what it looks like at the end. We, we actually draw it uh, this way as this chain. And it is called chain analysis because the chain has points, uh, uh, parts or it is weak. We can break the chain. So we drew it in this way. We're trying to see what is the event that started all this crisis. Uh, is, was there any vulnerability with the patient? Did they, she wasn't sleeping well. Uh, she had a toothache. She was having a fight before with her sister, for example. Any vulnerability that uh, aggravated the problem. The links in the, uh, the chain, um, here we, we mean uh, the, f the feeling, the emotion of the patient, the thoughts of the patient, and the actions of the patients that she uh, did before uh, committing suicide or attempting or having the thought or anything. And the consequences after, I tried to cut my wrist, or I, tried, I, I took some pills, or I uh, tried to uh, get the firearm of my father. Afterwards, what happened? The consequences of your behavior. So those are the points of the chain, prompting event, vulnerability, links in the chain, problematic behavior, we, we usually know it, it is fixed, suicide or parasuicidal behavior or self-harm, and the consequences. And this is a chain for a patient, uh, is a male, the prompting event, his girlfriend break, uh, broke up with him, that was the event, uh, the, the vulnerability, he was depressed. He, wa he had depression before even the event. Recently moved to live near girlfriend. He, he, has, uh, he had moved uh, recently and struggling to find work. He doesn't work and doesn't have money. So those are the vulnerabilities of this patient. Regarding the links, he had some thoughts like, my life is meaningless, I'm totally alone. He, he had a sinking feeling. He was feeling alone and lonely and, and, uh, and thinking in his problems. Uh, he texted his girlfriend telling that I'm going to kill myself. He, wa he had so thoughts about suicide and he didn't uh, tell, the, uh, tell his therapist, but he actually told his girlfriend and as consequences, his girlfriend rushed over and agrees to see him again. This was the chain of this patient. <laughs> Okay, um, another uh, patient also, uh, the prompting event, sister didn't call, feeling abandoned by my sister. It, she, she, this was a, um, a female patient uh, that had some troubles with her sister. Uh, so uh, for a week, the sister didn't call, she felt abandoned. Uh, and uh, sorry, the prompting event was a fight with the sister, sister uh, a fight with the sister three or four days uh, ago. And the vulnerability, um, the, my sister didn't call me uh, for the past four days. I'm feeling abandoned, I'm alone, she won't call me again. The links, emotions, I have some fear, and I have some anger, and I have some negative thoughts, I can't stand it anymore. The suicide urge, consequence, I'm a little bit distracted from the problems of my sister because when I try to kill myself, uh, they took me to the hospital, they took a little bit care of me, I thought about my health, I stopped to think about my sister for a few days. So this is the chain. And when the patient comes and sits in front of me, we have to draw the chain and mark every detail. Why do we do this chain? We do it not just to confront the patient with the details, because actually it's very painful when the patient is confronted with all those details she feels ashamed uh, and it, it gives more guilt. And we assure them that we do the chain to do something else called solution analysis. So this is your chain. Do you think where in this chain we could break, the ch break uh, any part so that the suicide urge wouldn't come? Tell me, what can you do? Uh, and, and we try to negotiate together. Uh, she can give me some clues because after the urge is gone, like you say, she's safe now and everything is okay, she can uh, think better. For example, uh, my sister hasn't called. D did you, could you do something about this? 
Well, I could have tried to call her myself, for example. Uh, I was feeling abandoned by my sister. Uh, could you do something about this? Uh, well, I could try to call my mom and ask her if my sister uh, uh, really is angry and doesn't want to call me, for example. Uh, you, you, you say that you have fear. How could you deal with this? Uh, well, I, s I learned some skills in the last um, group session. I could try to apply them. You felt angry. How could you deal with this? Uh, well, according to the skills, uh, I could go for jogging or maybe have a cool uh, shower or something that could help me. I can't stand it anymore. How could you do deal with this? Well, I could uh, write the idea down and try to write down some pros and cons. Do I really can't stand it? Am I strong enough or not? So, solution analysis. Where could you have done something different and avoided the suicide? What could you have done differently at each link in the chain of events to avoid the suicide? And what coping behaviors or skillful behaviors could you have used? Okay, I don't know if we have time to do the exercise. I don't think so. So, w I, I just want you to consider this if you have a suicidal patient. If uh, the patient is on the phone, we are trying to do the crisis management, the phone coaching. If I'm having the patient in front of myself, I've ha I have to explore more to know any, uh, to, to start to search for any weak point that could have been um, dealt with differently and then uh, stopping the suicide urge. And thank you very much for your attention. You mean how? Uh, uh, we are. We are. We are twelve persons. We are twelve therapists. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's very heavy, but we are trying to do our best to help them because it, I, I, now we are working um, nearly three years, and I really see a difference. We have lots of patients who stop to commit suicide for more than two years. Yeah, I understand uh, what you're talking about, but in Egypt we don't have uh, facilities other than hospitals, whether the family or a family or extended family or the hospital. Yes. Uh, no, 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 no. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>